This is going to change practice for a lot of people. Or if you've listened to my RSI and then they die video, maybe you already know this. Non-invasive ventilation by PAP specifically for the act of pre-oxygenation. In the right patient, this has always made a lot of sense to me, but now we have a multi-center RCT showing a significant benefit. So let's talk about the pre-oxy trial. Welcome back to First 10 EM. In emergency medicine and critical care, we see sick patients with very limited information and very limited prep time. So it's not at all surprising that the rate of complications in the peri-intubation period remains very high. But I think there is a lot that we can do to fix that. One of our biggest jobs is appropriate pre-oxygenation. And we all know about this, the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. We all know that it gets steep after about 90%. I want you to think about it like a cliff. And sure, at 90%, you're on solid ground, but you're right at the edge. You're playing on the edge of a precipice and you're about to plunge over the edge. 90% is not a place you'd want your kids playing. You don't even want them at 93%. Get them back from the edge. My ideal is to have every patient at 100% oxygen saturation before I start intubating. 100% tells me that I have done a good job in my pre-oxygenation, and that's my target, and I almost always get there. It may not be completely realistic, so 95% is my go-no-go -no -go number. If I can't get a patient to 95%, it's time to pause and think about what's wrong. Now, assuming that you have an open airway, and the patient is receiving flush rate oxygen from a non-rebreather and they're making some ventilatory efforts, there's really only one reason that the stats could still be low. The only way for oxygen saturation to stay low with an open airway, 100% oxygen by non-rebreather, is if the lungs are full of crud. It can be fluid from CHF, pus from pneumonia, your patient is drowning. They have a VQ mismatch, shunt physiology. And the only way to fix shunt physiology is PEEP. Now there are a couple different ways we could provide PEEP in the pre-oxygenation uh, phase. A PEEP valve on a BVM with nasal prongs underneath will work just fine. You could even put it in an LMA, that'll work. But the easiest and probably most effective way is to use a device specifically designed for PEEP or BiPAP, CPAP. And I've been teaching this for a long time, but to be fair, without good evidence. But luckily, that changed last week. So the pre-oxy trial just dropped just a couple days ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. And personally, I think it's a game changer. This is a multi-center RCT randomized 1,300 critically ill adult patients who were either in an emergency department or an ICU and they were randomized to either face mask oxygen or BiPAP for their three minutes of pre-oxygenation. And this is a pragmatic trial, so the airway management wasn't strictly controlled, but if you read through the manuscript, I think you'll see that they made a number of recommendations and all the recommendations are very reasonable. You can see it on the screen here for the most part. Face mask was with flush rate oxygen. You were allowed to use nasal cannula for apneic oxygenation. You were allowed to bag during the apneic period. All things that might have affected generalizability, but I think they did a very good job of managing in their protocol, at least at, in my opinion. These patients look like the kind of patients that I tend to intubate in the emergency department. They have a mean age of 61 and a half were presenting in hypoxic respiratory failure. Like a lot of studies, almost all of the intubations were done by residents or fellows, and that can sometimes be concerning, but these learners had a median of 50 prior intubations. So these aren't like pure novices. And knowing a few of these sites, my guess is that the fellow skill level here is probably better than most of us in the community. 
And so what are the key outcomes here? Well, their primary outcome was peri-intubation hypoxemia defined as an oxygen saturation less than 85% during the interval between induction of anesthesia and the two minutes after intubation. And that occurred in 9% of the non-invasive group and 19% of the face mask group. Statistically significant, an absolute difference of about 9% or an NNT of almost 10. I like that they used 85%, which probably matters more than those brief drops we see in a lot of trials below 90%. But they also tell us about patients who dropped below 70% which is definitely significant. It was 2% with non-invasive and almost 6% with a face mask. Peri-intubation arrest. Now it's only a secondary and exploratory secondary outcome, but it's clearly the most clinically important outcome. It occurred in 1% or sorry, in one patient or 0.2% of the non-invasive group, very low rate, as compared to 7%, seven patients or 1.1% with the face mask. So the numbers are close, but that is statistically significant. There were no differences in terms of aspiration or any of the safety outcomes. So across the board, this trial shows benefit from pre-oxygenation with non-invasive ventilation. This is a good trial. It's an important trial, but of course it isn't perfect. No trial is. So let's talk about some of the limitations before we decide on our clinical application. First, this is an unblinded trial. Unblinded trials always add a lot of bias. Now, for the most part here, they're looking at pretty objective numbers. And those numbers were recorded by an independent research assistant rather than the person intubating who might be a little bit more inclined to fudge the numbers after, say, a difficult intubation. No, no, that sat never got down below 85%, right? But even though oxygen saturation seems pretty objective, it's not really perfectly objective, especially in the resuscitation room where our patients are often in low flow states, we often get poor readings and you don't know whether you should trust that number. But if the number is displaying something that fits very well with your study hypothesis, you're probably more likely to write it down. And that's where the bias comes in. The next major limitation that I see here is the primary outcome itself. Now, I think the primary outcome that they used is a good outcome, and it's an outcome that I personally care about, but it is, of course, a surrogate monitor-based outcome. Now, it's a surrogate with strong associations with real patient-oriented outcomes, but it's not a real patient-oriented outcome itself. Now, I think it's an outcome that is important enough to guide my practice, but a mental adjustment is almost certainly needed here, right? Most patients who have a brief episode of hypoxemia are fine, right? It doesn't matter if your stats were 84% for 30 seconds. So although we talked in the results about an absolute risk reduction of 9% or a number needed to treat of almost 10, that's only for numbers on the SAT probe. That's not for clinical outcomes. Only a small fraction of these patients will have a real clinical outcome. And so the real benefit will be much smaller or the NNT is actually going to be a lot higher. And I think that's going to be an important consideration when you start thinking about cost benefit analysis here. And I think there are a couple pop, uh, issues with the population as well. Uh, first is something that a lot of trials do but this trial allowed the treating clinician to exclude patients if they thought that non-invasive was either indicated or contraindicated. And look, to some extent, that makes sense. You don't want to force somebody in a critically ill patient to use a technique that would be bad for the patient. But on the other hand, the whole point of this trial is that we don't know if this is a good idea. These exclusions have the potential to exclude the exact patients who we need studied, who need non-invasive, that, and that would bias the results of this trial towards the null hypothesis. But these exclusions could also exclude the patients who are at highest risk of adverse events, which would bias these results away from demonstrating harm. Look, I understand that these exclusions are often necessary but they are problematic. And I think if you're gonna have these kind of exclusions, you need to be a lot more strict. They don't fit well in a pragmatic trial. The other problem I have with this population is that I 
think it might have just been too broad, right? I don't think patients who start with SATs of 100% need non-invasive. The majority of my patients do just fine with flush rate oxygen, especially for a primary outcome of SATs below 85%. The patients where I want to use this technique are the patients who have shunt. The patients whose SATs you know, are still below 95% despite the fact that I put them on a 100% non rule breather. Now, if this trial had just focused on those specific treatments rather than all comers, I think we might have seen a much bigger benefit. Finally, a quick note about publication bias. I was sent a pre-publication copy of this paper. It was under embargo. I wasn't allowed to talk about this until the publication date. Incredible honor, but do you know who would never send me an early copy of their paper? Researchers who have negative studies. So even when all the studies are published, there is still a kind of publication bias that can occur where we publicize and talk about the positive studies way more than we talk about the negative studies. So in general, knowing that replication is a core of good science and that a lack of blinding adds a ton of bias, I almost never suggest practice change after a single unblinded study. However, another core of good science is Bayesian thinking. You have to consider the pretest probability. We know that non-invasive works great. We know that it's safe. And so before they even started this trial, I think there was a very high chance that this was going to show a benefit. And I think it's important to, to consider that when you draw your final conclusions. So what are our clinical take homes here? Well, for the average emergency doctor, I think that this is practice changing. I think a lot like, say, delayed sequence intubation, the question is not whether this technique should be used. Of course, it should be used. The questions are how often we should be using it, which patients really need it. And although it will change practice for a lot of people, it probably actually won't change my practice because this was already my practice. Look, if I can get a SAT of 100% on a non-breed breather, I think that's good enough. I'll use flush rate, and I don't think oxygenation is going to be an issue. Now, there might be other reasons to use non-invasive or a bag valve mask. Sometimes ventilation really matters, acidosis situations, for example. But that's not the issue being considered here. If, on the other hand, I can't get the SATs above 95% on a non-breed breather, assuming that the patient is moving some air and has an open airway, then I know that they're shunt and I know the patient needs some form of PEEP. And there are a number of different ways that we can do that. Yes, a PEEP valve on a bag valve mask will work. And in some settings, that's gonna be the right answer. Check out the comments on the RSI and then they die video because there are a lot of opinions here. But in a resource rich setting, it seems like a really good idea to me to use a properly made BiPAP machine. If you're really worried about waste, look, just keep the mask with the patient because the ICU is almost always gonna use BiPAP to wean the patient later anyway, and so you can just you reuse the same mask. But for some people, I imagine that this is going to be a really big practice change. It's not how most of us were taught. And there are a bunch of different practical ways you could Im implement this. So I am really interested to see thoughts, questions, arguments in the comments section. Until next time, take care.